to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took Jesus with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. A violent squall came up and waves were breaking over the boat so that it was already filling up. Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. They woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up rebuked the wind and said to the sea quiet be still the wind ceased and there was a great calm and he asked them why are you so terrified do you not yet have faith they were filled with great awe and said to one another who then is this whom even wind and sea obey the gospel of the lord so bombarded daily with that science is the answer to all things that are known but then they don't do it scientifically and you can't know some of the most important things in life through science if you if you take science as a hard science like you know physics or chemistry um, those kinds of things are they're quantifiable they're, they're able to be valued you know in in numbers or at least um, in a straightforward manner now once you get into the metaphysics you know beyond the physical then you get into that, as I preached before, you get into the, the realm of, you know, what is what is freedom and what is too little and what is too much. Uh, what about other feelings that I have about things that aren't something that somebody can you know, like, how much do you love me? Isn't that, like, that becomes a question about young couples especially, you know, like, how much do you love me? Like, how do you prove, I, I love you, you know, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. You know. And so it is with, with these relationship aspects that, that science cannot answer. I mean, even psychology and psychiatry can't answer. They can, you know, they can, they, they can call it a syndrome or whatever, but they really can't prove it out. All they get to do is like observe it. And that would be things like your relationship with your father. Now I didn't I didn't know how important that really was until later in life. And that that relationship with your earthly father really um, it, it's not it's not the motherly relationship it's a different kind of relationship it's still about love though and that the father you know because god has willed it to be so you know the father's role is is to lead and to provide and to defend and the woman's job is to teach love and and bear and raise children as only a mother lovingly can do so if a father, maybe because of his own upbringing or trauma in his own life, finds it difficult to express 
the love that he should have and and should express you, you get this kind of a cold relationship that that it is not very profitable for son or daughter because son or daughter is going is going to need the father's approval and they seek it so it's through the Old Testament in, in, the, in the stories that are in there. Like, which kid gets the, the father's blessing in, in the most um, ways? Joseph Technicolor Coat, you know, and his, his, all his brothers before him just weren't, weren't what God was pointing out was his favorite. Or, you know, the way that he treated David, who eventually became king. Or how he treat, treated Job. You know, so that Job, you know, was allowed to be put upon and and have all kinds of tragedy come into his life, you know, killing his family, wrecking everything, right? Let the devil just have his way with him. So that he could include it in scriptures that, you know, God's faithfulness to us and his expression of love never ends. It just never ends. So that and no matter what kind of strife we enter into, the Father's love is always going to be there. So, you know, an earthly Father's love, you know, is something that is an example to others. You know, how, you, how a father treats his wife, in front of the children especially, but in front of the world, shapes the kind of relationships that, you know, have been... They have been demonstrated before you, and so you think that's the relationship unless you go to another family and it's different. Or that you feel put upon, and you just want to get out of there. It's, it's, it's one of the uh, things that will get you the uh, annulment to your divorce, is if, you know, you ran away from home because you were pregnant. It's called a shotgun wedding, okay? The, but this expression of, of the father's love toward toward his wife is really important because it models for the children and the neighbors are watching, right? They might not say anything. So then when when you have children and, and they're not yet at the talking backstage, you know, they, they're, they're at the really needy stage and and you know the whole hop on top thing where you know my dad used to lay on the floor and let me and my brother jump up and down on him like we were riding a texas bronco you know and he didn't play with us that often so when when he did that we just totally enjoyed it and i was later on in life you know my own father couldn't even throw a football or a baseball with me just didn't seem to have the time or show up at a hockey game or any of that stuff. So for me, I, I, I began to resent that. And, and again, that's a choice that each individual makes. But, you know, the, again, that relationship that a father has with his children. And so, you know, you tell your daughter, she's beautiful. I don't care what she looks like exteriorly right she's your daughter and she's beautiful and that the man you want for her to you know to marry you want the best guy right because you love her and she and you want her to be happy and if she aspires to you know a career um, that you encourage her to do the very best she can you know to go as high as her abilities will allow her to be there to walk her down the aisle. It, it, it's an important thing. For boys, you know, dad, you know, they're going to get to a stage and they're going to be like little young bulls and they're going to start, you know, fighting. 
and they're gonna like be more disobedient. Well, when I was young, when my mother said to us boys, wait till your father gets home, that meant something. Because dad, even though he didn't see it, wasn't around, he was gonna back up mom, right? And you can see the destruction of the nuclear family having so much problems in, in the small micro cultures that we have in this country especially. You know, that if you don't have fathers taking responsibility for their children, that the, the input and discipline and love that only they can provide as a father, as a, as a true man, it breaks the culture down and then, and then what happens? What's modeled for the children gets repeated over and over and over. So the only thing that breaks these kinds of patterns, in my opinion, is that, is that God Almighty has to intervene and teach you what fatherhood is really about so that you can understand God as Father. If you didn't have a good father in your life, how do you want to look at God as, you know, this loving God, if your dad was a total jerk, or he left the family, or whatever, right? How do you see God in, in a really life-transforming way? There has to be grace involved. And examples of how, you know, men who aspire to be really good fathers act, especially towards their son. The sons need that approval. You know, they can run away, they can do all kinds of bad stuff. They can go to prison, they can do whatever. But that's why the prodigal son is in there, right? It's to show that, you know, if, if you recognize the authority of the father, that when you come back, you can be humble to that. Diminishing yourself, not at all. Not at all. And then you can, and then which, which son are you? Are, are you the one that stayed behind? Like, he's over there. Dad's throwing a huge party for the, you know, the party animal who left and was, you know, blew all his, his inheritance. And, and the son that stayed is like, hey, Dad, what are you doing? This guy was a total jerk. You know, left me to do all the, all the son's work. Takes off. Now he comes back and you throw him a huge party. Like, you didn't even give a scrawny goat to me and my buddies to have a party. What's up with that? And how does the father answer? He says, son, you're always with me. And everything I have is yours. That every blessing under heaven is what God wants to give the Father, the earthly Father, to distribute to his sons and daughters and take proper care and love of his wife. So the modeling of that comes in every image of the Father. So here's Jesus at the baptism and the Holy Spirit is there in the form of a dove. Well then, the Father speaks. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The affirmation of the father. It, it's absolutely important that fathers today have new models. Models to aspire to. Not models of a breakdown of culture where you don't want to accept anybody's authority and be disobedient and expect to get paid for it on top of it. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. You can't have a home without discipline. Doesn't mean you got, you got to like haul off and whack your kids. But, you know, back in the day, <clears throat> there were no tantrums in the cereal aisle. I'll guarantee. Right? You want to cry, I'll give you a reason to cry. So that, that's, spare the rod, spoil the child. There's a reality to that. Doesn't mean you beat your kid, right? You're trying to shape them. And sometimes, every one of us needs a little love tap to be reminded. <coughs> well, perhaps we can look at some of the chastisements that the Lord has allowed um, 
in the past and in our age right now as a little love tap to go like you need to get disciplined you need to put me first in your life you need to put others first science ain't gonna save you it's a great thing when it's correct but we we have examples of how to be a good father you know we talk about the fathers of our country we talk about our fathers in faith uh, we call you know the ordained minister of God's faith you know we we call Catholic's father and then the people get it all mixed up who aren't raised to understand that properly and they go like it says call no one your father <clears throat> What he's talking about is not the relationship of the father as being one that's in the in between God and us. It's talking about don't don't look to an earthly source for divine revelation. The things only God can do. So you you can go to the psychiatrist psychologists or whatever, and they have their place, they do. Um, but you can you can tell them all your sins, but they can't absolve you. And you know, if a priest is trying to be, you know, as best he can, then you love the confessional. Because of the ability to absolve sins, but it's in hearing the sins that you understand the, the problems that people face on a day-to-day -day level. In, in these days when, when authority is being scrapped on every level, I mean, that's what defund the police is about. That's about denying authority. Well, what, what does it lead to? Riots, fires, the vandalism, rape, murder. Oh, that's a really good idea. Let's take the people who are most disobedient and don't let them see what a father can do. It's the authority of the state, not the policeman himself. In the same way, the priest doesn't do anything on his own authority. He does it through the grace of Almighty God. And that's what can make a priest a good confessor and a good counselor. Because you understand what people struggle with. And with some wisdom over time, you might be able to make suggestions, right, on how to reshape how you're doing things. So I came back from this pilgrimage and had to come home and, and uh, tell my fiance God wanted me to be a priest. And, all this kind of stuff and Father's Day was two weeks off so I invited my dad over and uh, and I had a rosary for him and some other things that I had for him and I I never really celebrated Father's Day with him because we weren't reconciled so on this particular day um, so I'm the eldest son, and uh, I got my dad there, and I'm trying to love him and forgive him for the stuff I felt I didn't get or that I got too much of. And I was conceived on my parents' honeymoon. I know there, there was a secretary in the church, didn't want to use the word conceived. I'm like, well, then how do you deal with the Blessed Mother, right? Conceived without sin. We know what conceived means, right? <coughs> Two weeks into the honeymoon, little Ricky shows up. And the, the priest friend that was um, hosting them gave them this cross with an ivory corpus on it, poor elephant, um, on an ebony piece of wood and in the top reliquary are slivers of the true cross. In the bottom reliquary 
are the bones of St. Thomas and the bones of St. Patrick. My father's name was Thomas and my mother's name was Patricia. It always hung in a place of prominence in our house. When my father decided he wanted to divorce my mother after 30 years of marriage, it disappeared. And my dad swore up and down he didn't have it. Which was kind of a prevarication because no, he didn't have it on his person. No, he didn't have it where he's living now. So I'm talking about all the stuff that happened to me on this trip. And, and he goes, we got to go to the Quonset hut. So those Gomer Pile Quonset huts, we had one. It was up behind in the property. And he took a shovel. And he dug in the ground and he pulled up a plastic bag with this cross in it. He was literally compelled by God to return it. My parents ultimately reconciled and the church doesn't recognize divorce. And my father was changed in what some people would say is a, a nasty thing called dementia, but it made him a kinder, gentler, more loving person. So it seems like something that's bad in our lives can shape us to be really good. So no matter how our father was, whether he was really great or he missed the mark by some, the reality is, is that if we come to understand by faith who our Father in Heaven is, then we understand on a deeper level the things that we must needs be grateful for. First of all, love. You know, it's just formed differently in human beings. Animals are in fact are affectionate. I, I, you know, I love that, but it's just not the same. God is love, and when when we experience that love then we can learn to give it away because it never diminishes. We're just a mere conduit of it. We receive something and then when you give, fathers, when you give your love unreservedly to your wife and your kids, expecting nothing in return, what you get is what you want. You want to be loved. You want to be respected properly you know, and and good fatherhood says, look, I, I'm going to protect you as best I can. I'm going to provide for you as best I can. And I'm going to love you in spite of whatever difficult problems I had understanding what a good father is. So on, on Father's Day, we recognize something far different than we do on Mother's Day. But it's still the same love. It's, it's the love of a parent to a child. So indeed, our Father in Heaven, you know, has given us everything. And will continue to do so as long as we're willing to listen to His authority, obey His commandments. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And that in that grace and in that love, we will be transformed into what is truly the best part of us. So celebrate that love in your families. Uh, I was able to reconcile with my father, and, um, forgive him everything through the grace of God. And and so can you. Um, so, you know, enjoy the beautiful day this is. Enjoy, you know, the light breeze. You remember how cold it was six months ago. You see, you gotta, take in all of this gift and and you know for there to be you know greenery and things to grow it must need rain and storm a little bit so if that happens you know in your family and in your relationships you can survive that because god owns it all and he's given it to us so like the sun will come back out and things will grow, and there'll be a new season. May this season, outside of COVID, show a rebirth in faith and in trust, and indeed, 
the example of good fathers so that we can be the people that God has created us to be, loving, kind. Remember, God loves you. He wants you to be happy. He's not trying to rain on your parade. He's trying to rain on your vegetables. And in turn, the, the cows eat the good grain and grass. And if, uh, if he didn't intend for us to eat them, and he tells us to do it in scripture, if he didn't intend for us to eat them, why did he make them so tasty? God does love you. He wants you to be happy, and so do I. It's a pleasure, you know, having Mass with you today. Let us stand and profess the faith we share. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, and the Maker of heaven.